Hi everybody, David here and welcome to the ASOG podcast. In this episode, we are joined by Sean Tipping, the host of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. Sean has been in the automotive industry since 2005, where he worked as a technician full-time all the way up until 2017. Since then, he's been teaching at a local community college, and he also operates a mobile diagnostics and programming business. When he's not doing any of that, he is the host of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast, which you can check out at autodiagpodcast.com. Before we begin, make sure that you're subscribed to this podcast so you never miss an episode. If you're checking us out on YouTube, make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. Give us a like or a dislike if you absolutely hate it. Leave us a comment as well. It helps spread the word. And here we go. You know, Sean, one of the things that, that I really want to cover with this is you have a really unique perspective, right? Because you're an educator now. You've been a tech. You've got a mobile business now. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of your perspective is something that shop owners need to hear. And and one of my big things is I want to see us come together as an industry and And I kind of want to see us get to where shop owners have a little more understanding and appreciation for their technicians. They don't just look at them and say, oh, this guy messed this up. Right. Yeah. Um, And I think that this is a great way to do that. And I also think that, you know, with your educator background now, I think that's a really powerful way to talk about finding the new techs, hiring the new techs, bringing the new techs in. And, and help them understand what it takes to bring this tech in the right way, right? Yeah. We talked about that in your podcast, that it's really important that we don't just bring this tech in. And, and you know, when I started uh, improving my business, I had a coach and he said, you keep taking your employees to the edge of the dock, kicking them square in the back and saying, I hope you can swim. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think that's one of the problems we face in this industry. I read a post just the other day where somebody was talking about, I'm not going to bring any apprentices on because the last one messed this up and he messed this up and he messed that up. And the questioning started and it was, um, well, what training did you give him? How long was it that he was in the shop just shadowing before he started working on cars? Well, he just came right out of school and jumped on the car. Did he have a mentor? No. Uh, There's your problem. Yeah, setting him up for failure. Exactly. Well, I think a lot of shop owners expect uh, a certain level of competence leaving the school without any knowledge of what actually goes on at the school. So th- they're expecting these technicians to come in essentially ready to go and completely undermining you know, the difficulties of working on vehicles or the amount of value that, that comes from having hands-on practical everyday experience and so they bring these guys in out straight out of school and they're like man this guy doesn't know anything i have to teach him how to you know properly rack a car because he only racked x amount of vehicles at the at the school never racked you know ford f-150 with the frame rail that's three inches long sure you have to get it right in the perfect position so it doesn't fall off the lift on you and he's never racked that vehicle. And so, you know, you got to you gotta show him how to do it. And the shop owner's getting frustrated. He doesn't understand. Yeah, you quickly forget, uh, you know, when you're in the field for so many years and you're doing this eight, ten hours a day, every single day, you really do forget how you felt when you first started doing this. And it, it was kind of an eye-opener to me. Uh, when I started teaching and I'm back with these students in the shop at school and they really are green, even the ones that are really excited and they are very smart and they want to learn, they're fresh and, you know, they are experiencing these things for the first time. So you kind of have to jog your memory to go back to (laughs) that first time you're racking that F-150 and looking at it like, what the heck do I do here? Um, cause that's what they're going through, uh, on a daily basis with stuff, stuff they've never seen or never overcome in any way, uh, when, 
you know, if you've been doing this for a while, at least you have something to pull on. Even if it's a new vehicle, you've got some experience in some fashion. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I think comfort has so much to do with it, right? Because this kid could have a ton of talent and, and may have done this over and over again, but when they come into the shop, they're really nervous, right? And everybody's watching them and they're trying to make a good showing. And I think that, that we've got to start that culture and that growth right there when we start with them in the shop. And by that, I mean, you know, bring them into the fold, let them work with that other technician and let that technician walk them through that and let them get comfortable with the shop. Let them get comfortable with the staff, right? And, and let them get comfortable with the equipment. I think it's all too often we, we think when we bring a guy from a tech school or from college or from the high school and say, okay, go do it. And I just don't think that's realistic. Right. It can be, it can be good in certain situations, uh, you know, where you kind of throw them in the deep end and see what they can do. And I know at times as a technician, that definitely uh, boosted me along by being forced to figure something out, but you've got to pick the right times. And like you say, you got to make sure that they feel comfortable in doing this stuff. And um, yeah, there's just certain people who are going to operate much better in a low pressure scenario without, (laughs) you know, another technician or maybe even the customer hovering (laughs) over their shoulder while they're trying to do something for the first time. You're just, just asking for (laughs) problems at that point. Exactly. Absolute disaster. I, I, I still can't even work with a customer over top of my shoulder. No. I, can't <laughs> I can't do it. David, on the other hand, he's a true pro when it comes to customers <laughs> over his shoulder. He just doesn't answer the phone. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not out there working on these cars. <laughs> I, I realized very quickly in tech school that I was probably not cut out to be a tech. Um, I, I didn't have the the patience for it. Although if we had the um, the bevy of electric ratchets available when I was going through tech school, I mean, I, I remember being frustrated with how long it took to take a bolt out or put it back in, just turning the wrench, and I'm just waiting for the thing to be. <laughs> I'm sitting there cranking on it, and I'm like, "Come on, let's get going here." Um, yeah, I didn't have pat- patience for just simple things like that. I, I realized I, I probably shouldn't be wrenching. Uh, let me ask you this, Sean. Um, tell me about your what you do at the school. Um, how, you know, are, are you involved in 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 recruiting or bringing in new talent? What is it that you do with the school? Um, so my role, uh, obviously, is instructor for the automotive technology program, and we have a two year program. I teach all the students for the second year and prepare them you know, for graduation, getting full-time jobs in the field. Most of them are already working in the field, uh, you know, part-time after school weekend, stuff like that. But, you know, we're getting them set up to go out and be full-time technicians. Um, And so the majority of my time is in class or in the shop, just working with the students, trying to prepare them. We're trying to meet the ASE education foundation, uh, guidelines for accreditation uh, along with everything that I can do to, you know, realistically get them ready as a technician. Um, and then on top of that, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff at the college that you have to do as far as meetings and committees and professional development. And there's, there's just all kinds of stuff that I never realized <laughs> when I was a student that the teachers were doing. Uh, behind the scenes, so keeps uh, keeps me pretty busy. That's for sure. So when they these students are leaving your program, mm-hmm. are they mostly going into dealerships, or um, are they going into independence, or is it a mix? Honestly, I'd say it's a good fifty fifty. Some years vary. You know, some years you'll have a lot of guys working at dealerships. Now, our school is physically located. Uh, about two miles away from a section of highway that has, gosh, probably 15 dealerships on it. So they do come to us uh, looking for students quite often and they'll get quite a few of them. Uh, some of them have uh, like tech track programs where they will offer uh, tuition, reimbursement, uh, tool bonuses, sign-on bonuses, stuff like that to get them in. But 
we see a lot of our students go to the independent shops as well, too. Um, I think there's a right fit for everybody, uh, whether the student knows what the right fit is for them uh, at the time, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out as they go along. But uh, you know, some people really do prefer that the dealership style of, of things. And then there's other techs out there that they just want to work on everything. They want a little bit of it all. And I'll guide them towards the independent world for sure. What, you know, so when we talk about that, what are the things that you think the independent world could do better when it comes to attracting these new students as talent? What, what are the ways that we could do a little bit better job with that? Well, it's, you know, you're, you're up against it as, as an independent shop owner in the beginning. A lot of the reason, because of what I just mentioned is these dealerships are coming in with people that are hired to recruit. That's their job. <laughs> um, and they have all these programs with the big dollars behind them in order to get the students on board in the door at these dealerships. And obviously, you know, most independent shops are not going to have the budget for that. They're not going to be able to hire somebody just to recruit. I mean, if you can, that's fantastic. And you're doing a really good job of running your shop, obviously. But in reality, you don't see that too often. So um, in order to, you know, be more attractive to the students, um, it, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, I think what it really comes down to is getting getting the student or the prospective employee to your shop for an interview so that you can really go through with them. Here's what daily life is going to be like as a technician at our shop. And I think once they really see, okay, I'm going to be, you know, I got all these bonuses and stuff, but I'm going to be on the lube rack for, you know, two years before I get to do coolant flushes. Or I could come to an independent shop and I can actually start, you know, doing some real repairs, getting some real work done for, again, for the right person, that's, that's pretty attractive. And I think that's where um, it could be a, you know, more powerful draw for a potential employee. Right, right. How big are these dealerships that are near you? But I, because I can tell you that a lot of the dealerships in my area, and we're, I'm surrounded by dealerships. A lot of the dealerships in my area are first come, first serve. So it's all on seniority. And so that if you come in fresh, even through school or whatever, because we have a few schools around us, mm-hmm. um, if you come into that dealership, I mean, you're going to the lube rack and yep. you're going to be there for however long you need to be there until they either lose a tech uh, or that tech retires. And then whoever was there the longest gets the opportunity to move to a technician role and i've i mean I, one of the techs i hired away from from honda he had been on the lube rack for two years and he knew other lube technicians that had been there for seven plus years and they were they were still waiting for the opportunity to become a, a full tech uh i i've got a guy working for me now i think he put in 10 years at kia wow and he was just asking Kia, can I just keep doing my training, get certified, and then when a position opens up, I get to slip in there. But a lot of times they were paying them lube, lube tech price, uh, rates, Yeah. but they had them, you know, they were, they were having them do a lot of warranty work, especially if it was piling up, but they weren't paying them like a full tech because, oh, well, you're not labeled as a full tech, so we're not going to pay you like a full tech. We're going to pay you like a loop tech, but we're going to have you swapping engines out because we got 50 that need to be done outside. Sure. We don't have enough technicians. Um, is, is that what you're seeing at the dealerships around you? Or are they taking a completely different approach because they are getting talent fed into them through your school? That That's a pretty common setup. Um, I can't speak to every single one of them and how they run it, but that's what I hear a lot You know, from the people you know, that do end up going working there that they've got to wait their turn. It's a seniority uh, thing. And the, some of the um, service advisors or service managers that work at these dealerships, they're on our advisory committee and they will intentionally move people up along the, the line or, you know, in the seniority, I guess it would be if, 
you know, they show that potential as a technician. They come in, they show, you know, they've, they've got that drive, uh, they've got some skills, uh, they're, they're making it happen. They'll, they'll bump them up the line a little bit faster as far as pay goes and what they're doing. But uh, for the majority of the dealerships that I'm aware of around here, they do operate in that manner. Well, let me ask you this. So, you know, you talk about them coming into uh, the school. Mm-hmm. And working with the students and showing them the programs. Are you seeing independent shops do that? In other words, for instance, here at our high school and our, our college, I've, I've always tried to go in and say hello and introduce myself and speak to the students. Do you see as many independent shops trying to do something like that? Do you think that's an effective way that they can participate with the students? I think it would be, but no, I don't see that too often. Um, occasionally we've had people come in. And honestly, it's been um, the two times I'm thinking about right off the top of my head. It's former students who are working at one of these independent shops as technicians will actually come back and talk to the students about, hey, this is a great place to work. Um, Other than that, uh, we don't see it too often. We do have people on the advisory committee and they'll ask us, hey, do you have any technicians? Or maybe we'll get a call. That's probably the most common thing is we'll get a we'll get a phone call. Entirely self-serving. Y- yeah. Hey, do you have anybody that's looking for a job right now? Set Let me ask you about right. access. How much access do you, would you allow? Because I've got a community college uh-huh. that's near me. They won't let me come just walk in there and say, hey, I've got a legit business. Here's my business license. Mm. I've been in business for eight years. I need technicians, or I'd love to have somebody come down and, and uh, an apprentice here. Uh, I'd love to teach them what they need to know to be successful in the field. Yeah. They won't allow me to just walk in there. And even if I do volunteer, I signed up. This was like 2013. I had just opened. And I thought, I thought it a great opportunity to reach out to them. But, you know, for whatever reason, they've got plenty of suitors because they've got 25 dealerships that have 26 bays each yeah they need lots of people they don't want to talk to the independent necessarily so I'm, I'm curious does your school allow the access to it if somebody like lucas wanted to walk in and say hey can i talk to your students about what we're looking for not necessarily to pitch them for a job but just talk about the realities of the field yeah um our philosophy is yeah we want them to hear from all different sides in the in the you know the possibilities as far as where they could go work because like i mentioned there's a right place for everybody um and two of the instructors in the program we worked our entire technician careers in the aftermarket and so uh, you know obviously we're gonna probably lean towards that way but i I want everybody to come in there within reason we can't spend every single day (laughs) you know having people come in and talk about their shop but we don't there, there seems to be enough time. And a lot of times what the dealerships will do, they'll buy pizza for the kids, you know, and that's the lunch break, you know, they'll, they'll bring in their fancy Ford Raptor or whatever, and rev it up in the parking lot and <laughs> they'll have some pizza set up and they'll yeah. talk about what they got going on for a uh, technician position. So, but no, I, I would never turn any legitimate person away that wants to come in and offer these kids a job. I mean, that's, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's part of my job is not only to, you know, teach these students the best that I can, but find them a career, find them work when they're looking for it, when they're ready. And that's, that's part of it is exposing them to the potential employers. And if they can do it while they're at school, why not? Right, right. And, and so the way that I went about this, right, is I began to build a relationship with the educators and we started talking about things that we could do together, ways that we could work together, uh, go on the advisory council and began to, there help you go. That's the, that's the big one. Right. Right. And, and, you know, so like, is it really? Yeah. And, and, and look, I get junk cars out here all the time and I've got cars that people don't want to fix. And I will, I will just bluntly ask them, would you consider donating this car to the local high school? Absolutely. Right. They don't think another thing about it. And and that does a couple things. It allows them to have something to tinker with. It also means that they get to see something that they may see in the field if they're working in this community. And then on top of that, it gives them some scrap income, things like that when they go to sell it. But 
you know, I think for me, it was a real eye opening experience because I went into this thinking, hey, I just want to see how it works. It wasn't that I went in looking for a technician. That's not my purpose. I realized that we've got to begin to change something about our industry as a whole. Dealerships, independents, fleets. It's really hard to find technicians right now. Right. And David, don't yell at me. I'm sorry. I, I know it's not, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and there is a shortage. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, the, the shortage is real. Mm-hmm. Of course. And, and really, well, I mean, the whole hiring thing, what you're doing is just attracting somebody from a different shop that oh. maybe is not a good fit for that shop, but be a better fit. And that's the whole point. But you're, I mean, you're poaching is what you're doing. You're not bringing in somebody fresh and you're not helping to. You know, to add to the the shortage to help lower the shortage. Not really doing that. I mean, Sean's doing that, but by hiring somebody in, that's already a tag. You know, it's whatever. Well, I I guess my point is is that when I went into this, I was curious more than anything. I wanted to see how the process worked. I wanted to see how the kids were being educated. I want to see what the 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 educators' struggles were, and kind of have an understanding of where they were. And I'm telling you, I had a blast, right? I went to, and, and, you know, you get to see the shop and the shop out here is just amazing. I'll, uh, Sean, I'll send you some pictures of it, but I mean, it's an amazing shop. Um, and getting to work with them and see what they were doing and talk to them and hear their aspirations and their dreams and their ideas. And, and, you know, it was almost rejuvenating for me, right? It got me excited about the field even more than I was. Um, and in North Carolina, we have an apprenticeship program. So the apprenticeship programs uh, through the independent garage owners and I'm a board member. So I said, hey, you know, let's get involved with this. I'm going to tell you, we we brought uh, Bridget Johnson on. She is our apprentice. And I am telling you, she is a true asset to our business. Right. And and Bridget's gone from cleaning and working on cars and learning to test and diagnose cars, uh, the whole nine yards. And she is a real asset to this business. And we've watched her develop and grow and learn. And it was so neat to watch these guys in the shop. You know, we talk about culture in our shops. It was so neat to watch these guys take Bridget under their wing and say, hey, come out here and help me with this. And Bridget would start working on it and they'd say, hey, I've learned to do this this way. Maybe try this. Or if they're picking up a vehicle, hey, let me check and just make sure it's safe. Oh, you see what you did here? Do this instead. She's one of us. She goes to the training events with us. She's part of our team. And it does more than just lift Bridget up. It lifts these techs up because now they're a part of this. This is something special for them. They're not just working on cars. They're changing a young person's life. And I think that's really important. That's awesome. Do not have a lot of independent shops doing that in your area, Sean? <laughs> we we do not. Um, we do have some independent uh, technicians and shop owners that are on the advisory committee. Um, and <clears throat> like Lucas mentioned, it is a really good way to get to know Uh, the instructors, maybe some of the students, but the program itself. And like you mentioned, how the students are being educated. And it's, it's huge for us too, you know, because we're going to do the best we can. We're going to follow the ASC guidelines. But I mean, at the end of the day, I really do want to know what is the person, you know, who is hiring these students? What do they expect? What do they want out of these, you know, future technicians, what would they like to see? And that feedback is, you know, extremely valuable to us. So, you know, if nothing else, it's going to benefit you in the way that the, the employee that you might get is going to be better suited to your shop or your culture, what, you know, whatever you have going on, because you can give that feedback to us. So I, I'd encourage anybody that's not currently doing that to search out and see, yeah, is there a high school? Is there a community college locally? And I, I can almost guarantee most of them are looking for members for the advisory committee, for sure. That's awesome advice. It really is. Uh, I'm curious, the type of person that you're getting into your classroom. So I remember going through tech school Mm -hmm. and the people that were around me, you knew who was going to be a successful tech. Sure. Like that guy can, he can bang out some work. That guy is going to be very successful. 
we had a few gals in our class too and they were also very successful i mean they were very committed to being the becoming good techs but then you had the the middle of the bell curve let's say mm-hmm. <laughs> that's 60 ish percent and i think they had chosen that path because they didn't see any other option and the perception was i don't need to be that intelligent to work on cars mm-hmm. um are, are you seeing that but this you know that's that was 20 years ago are you seeing that to be the case are you getting the best and brightest at, instead of going down the the four-year liberal arts degree path that they've decided to go down the, the, the other path and, and become a tech work with their hands yeah you know we really do get a mix uh it's exactly like you say a lot of the people that do come into the program are a lot of the younger kids it seems to be that are just out of high school and maybe didn't get the best grades and weren't really successful uh, you know with the academics they go the route of a trade you know or automotive just because like you mentioned well that's what i'm going to have to do because i'm not smart you know that's that's what they've been told or that's what they believe of themselves and so they sure. they end up in our program and some of them do really really well with a hands on application some of them don't because it, it's just, it, it is still not the right thing for them. You know, there's something else out there that they're going to be really good at. Automotive is just not it. Um, as far as, you know, like top of the line, really smart individuals. We do get a few, um, but it's, it's far and few in between. You know, when you get that kid in your class and you're like, man, (laughs) this kid could be like a doctor or something, you know, like a a scientist or he's incredibly smart. You you don't see that as often come into automotive um, occasionally. And it's so awesome to see uh, somebody, you know, with all that potential uh, get ready for you know, their career and you know, they're just, they're just going to crush it. Uh, One of my students from a few years ago, he's now doing, um, mobile work for Tesla, where he drives around to people's houses and he actually services the Tesla vehicles at their house or work. And I, I when he graduated, this, this kid is just so, so smart. And I was like, I told him, I was like, just don't take anything less than, <laughs> you know, what you're worth because you, your potential is the, the sky. You're going to do awesome. And it's really, it really is cool to see uh, students like that, but I'm, I'm getting a, a bit off topic there. <laughs> um, the, um, yeah, it, it, it is interesting to see who comes into our program. One of the other things that we've been seeing recently in the last few years is a lot of uh, students from ESOL, which is English speakers of other languages. And so these are students a lot of times from other countries where you know, English is not their native language. And so it puts up a serious barrier for them, no matter what they want to do. And again, some of these students are incredibly smart. I worked with a, another kid from uh, Vietnam, very broken English, but man, he, he was my best student. He really was. Cause he tried, he tried twice as hard as anybody else in the class. But then when he got out in the shop, he had the hands-on ability that was far beyond everybody else in the class. Um, so I've actually really enjoyed working with a lot of these students that I can't, I can't always talk to them that well, but um, we sure, uh, we sure have a good time and, you know, we figure it out somehow or another. You know, that's a really, really interesting point. And, and so I know that there was an exchange student at the high school here. And the exchange student actually developed a really neat program. Um, And it leads into exactly what you were talking about and and the type of student into the class. So this exchange student comes in and helps them develop this idea that they're going to build their own electric vehicle, not a hot rod, not something else, something that that is going in the direction that our industry seems to be going in. He developed everything from how we're going to source the parts to the design of the system. And, and, and the kid will be an engineer at some point, no doubt about it. And, you know, he went to the rest of the school 
with his teacher and he said, hey, listen, uh, you know, to the arts department, we would love for you to help us design the paint scheme for the car and the stickering for the car and the logo for the automotive department. And then he goes to other departments and says, hey, we would love for you to have a part in this. Would you be interested in working with us on this? Um, You know, even the home ec department, would you help us with the interior? We want you to be a part of this. And I thought it was so interesting because what ended up happening out of this is that they came in and the very next year, the attendance shot through the roof. And instead of getting a lot of students who were automatically placed in the classes, Mm -hmm. it seems that they got students who said, I want to be a part of that. I want to be involved in that. And that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, and we've seen a little bit of that. I think it's a ripple effect with, uh, some of these, like I said, the ESOL students, um, they, they live in communities, you know, we, they have large families, they know a lot of people. And so we end up getting more students the next year because, Oh, Hey, you know, I knew Tommy. Um, and he said, this program was awesome. So I'm going to, you know, come do the same thing. Uh, so we, we've definitely experienced the same, the same thing, but hopefully that answered your question about the students. <laughs> you know, I, I definitely think that it does. And, and I think that it's interesting that the energy of the instructor has a direct correlation and the engagement of the community has a direct correlation on the type of the students that end up in the class. Right. I think that's really important to recognize is that when you have an instructor that's properly supported by the community and the instructor is fired up and ready to really do some cool things with the students and the students get to meet shop owners, whether they're they're from Toyota and it's a dealership, whether they're independent shops, they get to meet different people coming into the shop. The community's active in the process. And I think that's really neat because, you know, when they started on this process for the electric car, the community got involved in fundraising and the kids really engaged that and it got a ton of publicity. And I just think it's so neat to see how much the program changed just with that little bit of energy. Yeah. It's contagious. If you're you know, passionate about something, uh, you know, you really want to make a difference. People around you are going to start feeling that same way. Uh, And you can tell if you're trying to learn from somebody or even work with somebody who is disengaged or, you know, just negative about what they're doing every day, uh, you, you get that same feeling. So uh, I think, I think it's it's so important if you're going to teach or instruct whatever you're doing, just, yeah, be fired up, be excited about it. And just that alone, if you don't have any other skills, that alone will help uh, them learn or at least be excited about the topic. Right, right. And, and, you know, that excitement is so cool to get to, you know, I I know a lot of the listeners may have not been into, um, a school recently, but to go in and see that level of excitement, because, you know, so many of us have been conditioned, if you will, by years in the field. And, and there's days that we don't feel like doing this anymore. And to go in and see how excited they get about it and how engaged they can be. I mean, it's just, it's a fantastic experience. They haven't had to work on clapped out Ford edges. (laughs) (laughs) Or Dodge fans. Um, (laughs) What's that? Or Dodge Vans. Or Dodge Vans, yeah. Well, you know. Sorry, Dave. Is, I had to. Just put a tip them in it. It's fine most of the time. <laughs> That's it. Uh, I'm interested to know what these shop owners are asking for. So you, you said you're looking for feedback, and they're coming in, and you're looking for them to tell you, you know, the, the path for the technician to travel, mm-hmm. or at least lay out some framework. And, hey, we want to make sure that we're pumping out technicians that are going to be an asset to you as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. What is it that they're asking for when they, they give you your feedback? Um, it, it does vary, you know, individual to individual, you know, we've had people in there where they say stuff that's not really helpful. Like, can you teach them common sense or something like that? That's, that's not really (laughs) helpful. We, you know, we don't really get a whole lot out of that, but um, some of the things that have really helped us um, that, you know, I can attest to this, this makes a difference too, is to not try to teach them the entire car, the entire, you know, every little, you know, from bumper to bumper, every little thing to not focus 
so much on every little detail, but to really, really focus on the basics. When they get in there, they want their basics down pat, you know, the basic safety stuff, obviously, you know, being able to just, you know, work with threaded fasteners, know what the tools are. Basic electrical um, is a really big one that they're looking for. They just want them really familiar with the basic electrical systems, and then they can take it from there. And it, it honestly, it's the way that we have to do it because the car is so big nowadays that you can't, you can't teach the whole thing, especially to somebody yeah. new. Um, you've really got to work on the basics. Um, other than what about things like critical thinking skills and things like logic? We don't get too many direct requests for that. Um, it's part of uh, why <laughs> that, that's a good question. Um, it's part of what we, um, the, the college comes to us, administration comes to us, and that's part of the strategic goals for the college is to make sure we build that into our programs. And and I, I believe that we do. Um, but yeah, the shop owners aren't directly asking for that. Maybe that's the guy asking for common sense. Maybe that's what he meant. But um, uh, other than probably that- Probably not. Probably, yeah, probably. But I can't, I can't imagine- you know how how does a how do you teach somebody to approach a, a problem in, in a systematic fashion if they don't have any critical thinking skills if they if they don't know just basic logic? Oh, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, how agree. do you think through a problem? And you know, you're going to get frustrated, or you're going to look for that silver bullet because you have no direction to go in. Yeah, and you know. My, you know, minus the advisory committee input, that is one of the big goals I know of my personal uh, courses that I teach is first day we talk about critical thinking. We talk like thinking like a technician, meaning considering variables and, you know, uh, asking yourself questions like, you know, am I doing this test correctly? What do I expect from this test when I do it? Those sort of things we want them to be popping up in their head every single day, regardless of what they're doing. And so I try to build that in as much as I can, but, um, to, to answer your question, no, I haven't gotten that, you know, direct request from, uh, from a shop owner or service advisor. You know, um, I had a, a really great experience. We went down to the, uh, CTI research and development center and, um, Jim Kokonis basically taught us a, diagnostic process class to the techs and and all of our staff one day um just walked in and and we were talking about it and i said hey you know one of the things that i think we need to improve on in our industry is is the process right we're teaching a lot of classes we've got a lot of classes that are about how to do a specific task but we don't have a lot that cover the process right like what's the Mm -hmm. thought process and it was just an amazing experience to get to hear him um and i think a lot of the the experiences he talked about was from martial arts things like that and tying those other things into that uh kind of bigger thought process and um it was really neat so now we've got this thing that we do in the shop and and the guys will come in and i said before you ask me a question you need to go outside and house it they're like house it yeah, take your whiteboard, write down all the possibilities, act like your house on the TV show and stuff, <laughs> out, stuff out, you know? Sure. Um, and and it was a really neat experience. And I've, I've often said to Jim, I really wish he would, he would formulate that into a full-blown class and teach it. Because sometimes it's the process, right? It's not so much yeah. the exact task you're doing. It's the process and the thought process that goes behind it. Uh, so I think that's a really huge, huge thing. And, and you know, teaching them that, unfortunately, I think they need some experience in the field before they are able to truly embrace that, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we we do a project with the students um, towards the end of the year that it's called mind mapping. And I'll do this throughout the year too. But really what it is, it is, you know, when you're working through a, a problem, you're trying to figure out, you know, any you know, diagnostic problem, something wrong with the car is to really write out your thought process on a piece of paper. Okay. You know, I have a misfire. Where do I go from here? Let's write it out, put it on a piece of paper so that I can see what they're thinking and they can see, you know, their, their path and what they're thinking. And so then they can write out air, fuel and spark, and then they can go from there. And it really, really helps them to see, okay, this is my process, but it helps me 
as an instructor as well to see, you know, where are those roadblocks? Because obviously, you know, me and the student are going to be thinking about this a little differently. I may not understand where they're getting hung up in a certain process, but putting that onto paper has been, been a big big deal. And heck, I even do that for myself sometimes when I'm working through a challenging problem. I'll just take out a piece of paper and start writing the stuff down and it helps me get through the problem. That's a really awesome point. You know, let's talk for a minute about apprenticeship programs. Sure. You know, what are your thoughts on the apprenticeship programs? You know, you and I have talked about this in the past and and one of the things that I've seen is is in many cases, apprenticeship programs are either all or nothing, right? And I think that's something because you're dealing with someone's livelihood in some sense that we need to make sure is very structured and we give them a path forward, right? We give them the tools they need. What are your thoughts on apprenticeship programs? You know, for instance, I've, I've talked about the one here in the state and it's really great because it gives them a free two-year associate's degree. But I think it's important that the shops and the educators follow up on that. It's not just about paying for college. It's not just about paying for their tools. We need a way to to use that opportunity to raise them up. It's not just about having a, an employee come in. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I've always thought that that's something where the automotive industry as a whole has kind of, kind of been lacking. Because I know there are programs out there. There are not a ton around where we are. They have a few dealerships with them. That That's really it. And, it, you know, it's kind of far and few in between. But to have somebody that you could go on as as an actual apprentice and shadow them or work with them as an apprentice for X amount of time, I, I really do think that that would keep a lot of people in this industry that would otherwise leave. Because what I have seen a lot is students go out or just in the field watching technicians come in from wherever and they're immediately thrown either a to flat rate where they drowned because their skills aren't there or they're just getting oil changes or they're getting paid the, you know, 12, 13 bucks an hour to do oil changes and they can't pay their bills on it. Um, and not to say that an apprenticeship would pay much more than that, but they have something to, they have a goal to work towards and they're gaining skills along the way rather than, oh, I just burnt my arm on another exhaust manifold for 12 bucks an hour. This, this sucks. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so I think it would definitely help to retain people in the industry quite a bit if those were more prevalent. Right, right. And, and you know, so one of the things about that, like in our shop, our apprentice makes sixteen fifty an hour, right? And works as many hours as she wants to work. Um, one of the things that I did not know about, and I think there needs to be some communication about the subject, is that there were a lot of her task lists that could be completed in shop through actual work experience. Okay. And so, you know, we were able to put her with a technician and he was able to say to her instructor, yes, she's proficient on brakes. She knows how to do brakes. She knows to, to wash the rotors. She knows how to correct a concern after it happens and cover specifics of that task list to his satisfaction on that. Um, so I think there needs to be some type of curriculum backup. Right. So that when we bring somebody into a shop, because, you know, here's what happens from my perspective. Right. We get really busy in the shop. It's really difficult to keep up with what we already have to do. Mm -hmm. And now we bring another staff member in that needs some additional attention. Right. If we had some type of curriculum or had some type of guide that says on on this day or this week, here's some of the things we need to focus on. I think that would be a great opportunity because it takes some of the workload off of the shop owner or the technician that's helping. It gives us something to work with. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll tell you what, having something like that where the students could meet uh, taskless requirements on the job sure would have been helpful this spring uh, during COVID. Now, I know that's kind of a unique situation, but it, it does show where it can be useful because we couldn't do anything in the shop this spring. We couldn't even go onto campus. It was all online and you can't teach a trade online. You just, you can't right. do it. Um, you can try and it's going to be you know, subpar. It's going to be low quality because you have to do this stuff with your hands. Now, had we had something in place where students could go to the place where they're already going to work 
and the shops are busy and they can do they can complete these things. Um, obviously, that would have helped there, but it would help during the year as well. The challenge to it would be getting with each individual shop and making sure um, basically the quality of what they're doing, uh, you know, the quality of what we need to achieve to meet those standards is met in shop because we can't be there as an instructor. So that's a sit down, you know, with the people in the shop, with the owner, with the, you know, the service advisor or whoever it is that we're dealing with to make sure that when they do this task, that they're actually completing it so we can sign off on it and know that the student has actually met that requirement. Not to say they can't be done, but that's where I think the, uh, the legwork would be. Right. 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 Well, if the shop owner didn't do it, it'd be to their own detriment. I, I don't, I mean, I think it, it, of course it depends on the type of shop and their culture. I mean, if you've got a shop that's willing to take the time to, to have somebody in there like that and do the work, uh, and on top of that, too, I think maybe the more difficult thing is to what standard, because a break job at my shop is not the same thing as a break job at some other shops. Yeah, I, I 100% there's agree. Some, <laughs> there's some bad habits being formed out there in the field, mm-hmm. and you see it when you hire somebody in, and they're like, oh, we've never done anything like that. Like, what are you talking about? Cleaning the guide pins? You've never cleaned the guide pins? <laughs> no, we just slap some pads in there and, and ship it. Uh, I mean, so maybe there's that aspect of it. But I think any any shop owner that's willing to to take on the task, I doubt they'll have any problem making sure that they're at least meeting some standards or ensuring that this person is actually proficient at it to their satisfaction that they would even – I mean, you could even do something like show that they're – actually billing out hours like they're putting their names on the sure. ro uh and at that point there i mean they're the shop owners staking their reputation on that repair yeah um, it's not quite as as uh it, it's much more involved than just signing off and saying yeah he knows what he's doing yeah and i'm just i'm thinking as we're going i mean today it'd be easy enough to do a uh, record a video of some sort you know while the student's yeah. doing it and here i'll turn this into the instructor you know, for credit for this task. And that would be, that would be a pretty easy solution for most of this stuff. So it's, it's definitely uh, doable uh, for sure. Very cool. Very cool. So, well, there you go. You solve some, uh, some world problems there, Lucas. I know, right? Absolutely. <laughs> We've done it now. Well, you know, one of the things that we had talked about when we started the podcast here this afternoon, this evening, what is it? Is it night? Oh my God, it's night. Um, <laughs> the life of a shop owner, huh? Um, in all seriousness though, you know, I, I kind of view you as an advocate to the technician. I've listened to your podcast for a while now. I've seen kind of how you think and, and through your podcast, um, a lot of the directions you take as an advocate for mobile technicians and technicians, what would you say to these shop owners? You know, we, we hear a lot of back and forth technicians who are unhappy with shop owners and shop owners who are unhappy with technicians. And you talk to a lot of technicians. What's your perspective? What is it that we can do better as an industry to help to move ourselves forward? How can we be better to the technicians? Um, well, I'll tell you one of the biggest things when I was a technician and this was when I was working at Firestone, but it really reflected my entire time with a number of different shops. Uh, you know, I'd worked for some really just not good people and, and the opposite too. I worked for some really good people, but the people that I worked for, a store manager in Firestone really stands out in my mind that I really, really enjoyed working with him, working for him in the shop at Firestone. And that, I mean, that is really saying something because it's, I, I don't know, it's not, it's not the best uh, place to go work as a technician. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that, whatever. Um, put, put them on blast. It's okay. They, they have, <laughs> They're never going to listen to this. They have their, yeah, right. They have their issues. And so I worked for the store manager at Firestone. I worked with him for about, I think, five, five or six years. And he, 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 did a really good job of the store. We made a lot of money, but his thing was that he really genuinely cared 
about his technicians and especially the guys who were making him money, of course, but he would genuinely show that he did really care about us, that we were not just an employee. We're not just a number. It's not just about that flat rate at the end of the day uh, that, you know, I actually do care about you. You know, we got to do this. We're in this together. I'm going to take care of you. And of course I got to hold up my end of the deal. I'm going to come in and kick ass and do my thing and, and, you know, crush flat rate or whatever, and, and try not to (laughs) cause any major problems, but that he's going to take care of me too. You know, Oh, Hey, it's Friday. Hey, I know you're trying to get out of here to go have dinner with your wife. I bought that job overnight, you know, get out of here. It's fine. Or, Hey, you need this Saturday off to go do this thing. Sure. Whatever. No big problem. And it was just always a constant thing where he was showing a genuine care. It wasn't faking it. It's not like a salesman or anything like that, but that, it was, it was visible. And so I still keep in contact with this guy. You know, we don't talk all that long and I haven't worked with him since I think 2016, but he runs a Firestone over on the other side of the cities and I'll go and I'll drive an hour across the cities if he has got something that he needs me to, to diagnose or program or whatever, where generally I'm not driving across, you know, an hour across town you know, for just anybody, but we still have that relationship. And again, I think it goes back to just, you know, he was showing us that, that he really did care about us and I enjoyed working with him. And maybe that's a personal thing. You know, some people, maybe they're just there to make a paycheck, but I don't know. I think in the long run, if it's something you're going to do for, you know, 50, 60 hours a week, every week, um, it is really nice to know that the people that you're working with or for uh, care about you as a person. That, that's a really valid point. And, and, you know, one of the things that um, we, we've begun, maybe that's not the way to say it. One of the things that we see more and more is money is not the primary motivator in all cases, right? More money is always great for everybody, right? And I think that shops really do need to work on making sure their their technicians are paid appropriately and following the proper formula to ensure the shop's profitable and they're paying their people well. But it's not just about money. And you bring up a really good point. And, and you know, Dutch is one of the moderators for ASOG. And, and Dutch is, is extremely founded in the fact that we are about relational business operations, not transactional. And those relational models really focus on the customers. And they focus on the staff. And they focus on building something more than just a, a financial relationship. And, you know, I think that's so important. And and maybe that's some of what's missing in shops today is that communication about, hey, we really do care. I think that, that technicians and service writers are truly internal customers, right? And we have to make sure they stay happy just like we have to make sure our customers stay happy. So it, it's a really good point that you make that sometimes it's not money. Sometimes it's just how we treat people that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. Um, of course. Yeah. Money's nice. That's uh, why we're at work, but <laughs> you know, it's, we're spending more time with people at work than we do with our families a lot of the time. So uh, it, it's just, it's good to be in a, a good atmosphere and, and know that the people around you care. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the ASOG podcast. You can check out more with Sean at autodiagpodcast.com. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to email me at david at asog.site. That's D-A-V-I-D at A-S-O-G dot S-I-T-E. Until next time.